Welcome back to the Developer Tribe, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. This podcast delves into the processes and practices of coaches, educators, and beyond, offering their insight and giving us cause to reflect. Before we start, with this being the last episode of our first season, I wanted to send out appreciation to all of the guests for their time and openness, and to you for taking the time to listen. As ever, thank you for being here, however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Erdner, Assistant Professor at Adams State University and author of a recently published book, Dear Coach, What I Wish I Could Have Told You, Letters from Your Athletes. I became aware of Sarah's work through a post about this book on LinkedIn and had to reach out to get Sarah on the show. The book is the culmination of an academic journey that has seen Sarah gain a bachelor's and master's in communication studies and a PhD in sports psychology with an emphasis in coaching education. Both the book and Sarah have so much to offer our understanding of coach-athlete relationships and the positives and negatives of that dyad. Sarah, it's a joy to have you here today. How are the mountains treating you? They are treating me well. The views are great. It is cold here. It was nine degrees here in Colorado, um, but I welcome it. So. Yeah, nine, no, I don't think we can quite challenge that here in Scotland. We're pretty close, though. Um, so let, let's start with your journey and how it was that you came to put this publication together. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, so, again, my PhD is in sports psychology and motor behavior. And in that three year journey in a PhD, I knew I came in knowing I wanted to research the coach athlete relationship because I had um, my emphasis in my, my communication degrees was interpersonal relationships. I myself being an athlete was always very curious about my relationships with my coaches, how it influenced my performance. Um, So I I met uh, Dr. Becky Zakrychuk, who is my PhD mentor, uh, and we had that similar research interest. So I started working with her and I started, uh, and you would know this as a PhD student yourself, uh, interviewing coaches about their experience with the coach athlete relationship, specifically asking them about their perceptions on how they perceive, uh, how they influence athlete resilience, uh, when the athlete is experiencing major stress. And I did that, uh, to be honest, in large part, because coaches are easier to access than student athletes are than athletes are. And when you're a PhD student needing to do research and you have a short amount of time doing it, But when I was interviewing them, almost every one of them, the most saturated uh, aspect of those interviews was that at the end, they said, you know, Sarah, um, we love that you're asking us this, but we would be so curious to know what the athletes think. What do they think about how we influence their ability to bounce back after major stress? And I, it was where I wanted to start, but the gatekeeper process to, um, get to athletes is harder. And, but I knew I I had to follow the cookie crumbs. So I approached uh, Becky, my PhD advisor and said, we need to make a a redirect on what my dissertation is and, and make it to where I'm interviewing athletes about their experience, what their perceptions are of how the coach influences their ability to be resilient after experiencing major stress. And so, um, did the IRB, went that whole process, did the grueling process of getting access to the student athletes, to just athletes in general. So my dissertation was on NCAA Division I student athletes, uh, uh, perceptions of how the coach influences their resilience. When I approached those interviews though, and what I'd written up in my IRB was that I thought they would be clean cut 60 to 90 minute interviews, which is what most qualitative interviews are, um, maybe a little more or less. But when I got into those meetings, they were two to three hour long conversations uh, where we, some of them, we didn't even fully finish. I mean, they had more they wanted to say, but after three hours, you need to, you have meetings and practice you need to go to. And, uh, and that's when I realized I had hit an untapped oil rig of stories that have not been shared before. And nobody, maybe other than amongst teammates, had these athletes maybe spoken about their experiences, nobody else had asked them, especially me, this neutral person that was interested in their stories. And so I defended my dissertation successfully and my core uh, faculty that were on my committee to approve me to become a PhD uh, 
sent emails and encouraged me to go the uh, publishing a book route. And they, they noted, they said, these are powerful stories and these stories need to be heard. And so kind of against the grain, uh, again, I had that um, insular, you know, those immediate people that supported me, but there were also people in the meso level that didn't necessarily support me going from defending a dissertation to writing a book because we're in academia. Uh, we are expected to defend the dissertation and then write it into a research publication for journal publications. Um, and I didn't do that. And so there were some people that weren't very happy with me because that meant that they were going to miss out on having authorship on that research journal uh, article. Um, but I knew in my gut uh, for the, to do right by these athletes um, and I knew that this message, I'd, I could have gone the research publication route and then written the book, which is what many people were telling me to do. Uh, and when I sat with it and meditated on it, I felt as if that that is not what the world needs for me to wait longer, that the world needs these stories sooner rather than later. And that by me going the research journal publication route was just me fluffing my own academic scholarly ego and not actually doing right by the athletes and the marginalized voices in sport. So... Uh, thank you so much for describing that and that must have been quite difficult to navigate through getting into a publication of a book rather than going the journal route I can understand that I'm very fledgling in my PhD uh, career here but I can start to understand why that may have been important to some of the people around you um, and there are, there are examples I can think of of others that I've spoken to where they've then said to me well it's it's going to be four or five years before these results actually get out there. Well, I'm thinking, well, I actually kind of need this now. Um, so I, I get it. I do get it. Can you, you, you mentioned a couple of times that the, the words major stress, can you give us some examples of what a major stress for an athlete might look like? Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to pull in Dr. Uh, Mustafa Sakar uh, and his colleagues, David Fletcher. So they're the leading researchers there in the UK um, on resilience and sport. And so they really helped us understand the conceptualization and operationalization of resilience in sport. So previous to their work, we only knew about resilience generally. And so a lot of the stuff that they bring to light on major stress and it can, it's contextual as well. So if we're dealing with college athletes, you know, you got academics that are there. But there's also things that are outside of uh, sport, outside of academia, so what's going on in their lives. Uh, so for the particular athletes that were in my study, we had people that were experiencing parent divorces, um, people that were experiencing near-death experiences on uh, hospital beds due to uh, just illness, um, people that are experiencing different uh, oppression uh, based on their religious perception, uh, based on their uh, religion. Um, so it's a wide, it's a, it casts a wide net. And we also have to understand that it comes from what depends on major stress uh, is how it is perceived by the athlete. And so, for example, like if I'm going through something and I'm like, this is major stress, but the coach themselves is like, well, in my eyes, that's not major stress. It doesn't matter what the coach thinks right? It's through the eyes of the beholder. And so major stress is a very wide net. And that's definitely something that I, um, I had had parameters around it. I had reached out to people that had shared pretty uh, horrendous stories, again, you know, near death experiences in hospitals, um, survivor stories. So in order to meet that need of being major stress, but then some of them was just major stress, like sport injury, um, uh, parent divorces, kind of these things that we see a lot of people going through that are more common than potentially dying on a hospital bed. So, Okay. Well, th yeah, again, thank you for describing that. It sounded when you were speaking before about the athletes you went to speak to and the time that was taken and it could have been longer, that c clearly there were these sort of untapped stories and narratives that the athletes wanted to tell apart from the fact that i'm sure you you were able to develop that rapport and give them that safe space in order to speak why was it that they felt they were able to open up with you rather than already having spoken to someone was it just that they didn't have the opportunity or 
how did that come about? I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the main ones that comes to mind is that I was a neutral party that was not financially connected to their coach. I was not being paid by the same organization that their coach was being paid for. Thus, they felt safe to know that if they told me the things they told me, that there wasn't any challenge of me running into the coach in the hallway, uh, me going out and getting drinks with colleagues and maybe slipping and saying something I shouldn't, that there was like, I was seven degrees separated. I think that that was a part of it. I think another part of it was that I, obviously we have to sign informed consent um, forms, uh, especially with the dissertation, where I, when I sat down and had the, well, before we started the interview, I let them know my passion for this. I let them know that, and at the end of the interview, I said what they were giving me was powerful and that I feel a responsibility to their story beyond just them helping me get my PhD uh, and very much explain that, that what I felt like I was doing here was something that I wanted to make an impact globally. And so I think, and I think they felt that they really did and how we were in this interview. And again, it was a semi-structured interview. Uh, again, it turned more into a conversation to where at, there were many athletes that were crying that would then provoke me to tears to see them in this pain and knowing that they didn't need to experience that pain and what can we do to make sure that that pain isn't continued to be experienced. Uh, so I think that that really set the stage for them feeling comfortable of hopefully they felt that there's finally somebody uh, that cares enough. And for me, obviously I'm in sport. I've, I've played sport. I have a degree in sports psychology. Um, I still work in sport as a mental performance consultant, a CMPC through our national organization. But I'm far enough removed from it that I'm able to, to see things objectively. Um, and I also have the education and understanding what are best coaching practices, you know, what is best athlete processing practices to then start putting the dots together to say something needs to, something needs to happen here. Um, so I think that that's why we got to the two to three hour conversations. Sort of mix and balance of knowledge and expertise within that industry, but enough distance away from their immediate environment. I can understand that. And yesterday I read about um, a, a news article from UC Berkeley, some athletes there coming out and speaking about long-term problems with uh, a head coach. I, I didn't manage to catch the details exactly, but it certainly seemed like it was similar to some of these stories that, that had been um, with, with the athletes you spoke to. How, how did we get to this point, you know, through, through coach education, you know, the coach education I've been through, there are courses on safeguarding, well-being, those things exist. And yet we're starting to hear of, of all of these stories happening. Hopefully it's happening less. Yeah. How did we get to this point? I think there's many ways we've gotten to this point and I can't address all of them on this podcast or we would be here for a week. Sure. <laughs> um, some things that come to my mind. Uh, I think formal coaching education is something that's on the horizon um, that there are talks at the national and even, you know, international level on how to uh, make that happen. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs of that necessarily. It's conversations I do want to start having. Um, that are, are I want to be become a part of those conversations that are already having uh, happening. I think one thing that has happened from a psychological and sociological perspective is that we have to understand the history of sport uh, in order to understand how we have gotten here. And so I want to start this out by saying again, I want this conversation to be calling people in rather than calling people out. And so it might seem like I'm starting out by calling people out, but I'm going to transition into calling people in. So sport was built by white, middle-class, able-bodied, cisgendered men for white, middle-class, able-bodied, cisgendered men to produce better white, middle-class, able-bodied, cisgendered men. 
And that's just the, the history of sport. And so because it was started, created by the certain demographic of people that have been known to possess power uh, for eternity, um, or as for long as we've known, especially for our history here in the United States, probably in the UK, those were the individuals that were defining sport. So they were conceptualizing sport and they were also operationalizing sport, which means how does sport inter how do we interact these definitions? How do we engage these definitions uh, in action? And so that started out fine and well because it was an in-group creating it, or it was one group creating it for their in-group. And then as time progressed, uh, an example of this would be like Title IX. Um, we have allowed access for women into sport, other marginalized groups into sport, you know, the BIPOC community, black indigenous people of color, the LGBTQIA community. We've allowed more of these people access into sport, but we never questioned the foundation from which sport was built, uh, which is a very patriarchal narrative. It is very much this macho uh, idea of what it means to be a man. And so we basically, uh, held the hands of these marginalized individuals and walked them in. So we took these beautiful, what I say, quote unquote, square bodies and asked them, we gave them access into sport, but we forced them into the round mold that is white, middle class, able bodied, cisgendered male sport. And in order to make it in sport, this is what you had to be. And so the subtext that was being written, it wasn't overtly stated, was that me, so an example, like me as a woman, when I played sport, looking back on my experience in sport, um, I'll give you this example. So recently, I'm in, I'll, I'll speak a lot about my counseling experience. I've been in therapy for a really long time, and a lot of it has been unpacking um, my time in sport. Uh, I recently, probably a year ago, I write in journals a lot, and I wrote, one day I, I write a lot of to and from my emotions to process my emotions. And sometimes I'll just write maybe letters to particular people. Um, in this particular day, I was at a road walk and what I needed to write, but I also knew I needed to write something. And I wrote on that journal entry over and over again. I said, I wish I was an effing man over and over and over again. And bringing that journal entry into counseling with me, uh, and sharing it with my counselor and sobbing because I knew the root of it all is that sport had taught me to hate myself, to disregard myself as a woman because sport was built by men for men to produce better men. And because I was asked to basically fit my body into the round mold that is sport, I lost a sense of who I was. So again, that's, I don't want this to seem calling out to white middle-class able-bodied cisgender men. I want to call you in. And the reason why I want to call you in is because that same conceptualization and operationalization that was imposed upon sport by this particular population, this particular group of people that just so happened to be white, all these demographics, it also has screwed men over. Men haven't even been given the choice on who they want to be as men. They are forced into this narrative of what they think, what all of us have been taught, men, women, every type of group, that this is what it means to be a man. And so it hurts all of us. And, and I think how we've gotten here today, especially is we have to understand that history and how it's contributed to when I teach my methods of coaching class, I always ask them, what does it mean to be a good athlete? And then a lot of the things they give are things that are very patriarchal in, their, in, uh, in nature. And so shifting now to how did we get to where we're at today we have so many athletes that become coaches. So many that really it's this vicious cycle of we're just perpetuating the same problem over and over again. Um, where athletes were treated one way and then they get annoyed, right? Like they're annoyed that they're being treated this way. And so, but their mirror neurons in their brain are mimic, they're going to, they're mimicking the behavior that they have been shown by their coach. And then when they become a coach, they have a higher probability of enacting the same behaviors, whether they want to or not. Right. Like there's so many coaches that I'll have conversations with that they'll start crying and they're like, I'm just, I'm scared. I'm becoming my coach. 
And if we don't address, uh, and that's what I help walk through people in my book about, uh, address the behaviors that have been acted upon us and process those behaviors, then we're going to, whether we like it or not, enact those same behaviors. Um, and I just listened to a podcast actually recently this week that really convicted me. So I'm going to speak about this from my point of view, and then I'll sum up this response. It was a podcast talking about relational trauma in the workplace. And so I've had my fair share of experiencing relational trauma, experiencing power figures um, powering over me, not powering with me. And that has created relational trauma in myself, much like I think a lot of the listeners of this podcast could agree. I've experienced relational trauma within my coach athlete relationship. And thus, because you've experienced relational trauma in the workplace, we oftentimes like to be in controlling situations now, right? Like we don't want uh, to continue being in an abusive relationship. So we seek out leadership positions in order for us to be the ones that are in control so that we don't get hurt again. At, like <laughs> I listened to that and I was like, Oh my gosh, because I have, I mean, here I have a PhD. I'm an assistant professor. I have many power positions in the world. And I was like, Oh my gosh how much I have probably implicitly been seeking out those power positions so that I don't have to answer to too many people. Because when I was younger and I had to answer to more people like my parents and my coaches, that was where the relational trauma occurred. And so in order to not continue experiencing that relational trauma, I'm going to seek out power positions. And I think that's what we're seeing today in coaching is that coaches are in one way or another, potentially seeking out power positions so that they're not the ones being hurt anymore. And maybe unbeknownst to them, they're the ones hurting other people. But we try to justify it by saying, well, it wasn't that bad. I'm not hurting you as bad as I'm hurting my coach. You might not overtly say that, um, you know, as bad as my coach was hurting me. And so I think that's where we've gotten to where we're at today is there's not the adequate accountability there to hold coaches accountable to a higher standard. So wonderful answer. There's so much to unpack. Um, the first thing that sh came to mind for me, there was right at the end of what you were saying, a, a phrase that has stuck with me for a long time, which is, hurt people hurt people. Um, and certainly through my work as a, a coach developer, one of the things that has always frustrated me the most is dealing with mostly male coaches one or two females who effectively lord over their, over their athletes, that they are center stage. Um, and the reason it's a frustration is because when you actually talk to them one-to-one, -one, they'll say they're not, that that's, that's definitely not who they are. And unfortunately, then when you actually go and watch them, it's exactly who they are. So it becomes very difficult to, to make that apparent to them. So that's an interesting way that you've put that, that potentially is part of a vicious cycle. Um, so how, how do we go about breaking that cycle? Well, I will say this. Um, I think a lot of what we see, we see a lot of angry coaches um, in sport. And it's interesting because we have allowed this to go on for so long. And I, I brought up, I actually just finished writing a chapter for a book. Um, and I quoted, so Bell Hooks is a, a mentor of mine. I've never met her before, but Bell Hooks, if you ever hear this, I would love to meet you. And she talks about, she has a book called The Will to Change Men, Masculinity, and Love. And I'm in uh, three-fourths of the way through it. It's a wonderful book. That's helped me as a woman understand myself more too, because women perpetuate uh, a patriarchal narrative just as much as men do. And she says, anger can be and usually is the hiding place for fear and pain. And that we don't allow men, especially in society, to express themselves emotionally. We don't, it's, it's not manly, and I'm quote unquoting that, uh, it's not manly uh, for men to express their full level of emotion to fully tap into well-being, right? And us as women have also, uh, we buy into this too. And Brene Brown's work on vulnerability also sheds light on this 
uh, women will often in a heterosexual relationship, they'll ask their men, uh, we want you to be more emotional. And in the moment that the man is more emotional with us, they're like, oh, like, I don't think I like this. Like, I don't, you know, and they'll start shunning the men overtly. And so again, women, I'm, I'm calling women into this conversation as well, that we also are um, perpetuating the same problem. So yes, hurt people hurt people. And a lot of that is because there's an angry base there because you've had wrongdoing done to you probably as an athlete by a coach. And I think that that's really important to note because one of the things I champion in the book that I think we've done a lousy job advocating for coaches. I think that we have athlete, like athletes have resources, again, different types of resources, depending upon the, the level of play. Uh, but we have mental health programs for athletes, mental performance resources for them to tap into, uh, all these different things that they can get. And then the athlete turns a coach. What do the coaches have? Where did the resources go for them? And what's so interesting is as a CMPC, a certified mental performance consultant, I work with athletes on how to take their game from good to great. So let me give you the mental tools you need to become a better athlete. 75 to 80% of those meetings I have with athletes are talking to them about the issues they have with their coach and how their coach is hindering their performance. And so I'm basically teaching them skills on how to cope with their coach. And so in my head, from a CMPC perspective, I think we're putting all of our money into resources for athletes, which is simply a band-aid approach when we need to be putting our money also toward resources for coaches so that they can be mentally healthier. They are also performance on the sidelines. How, um, how can we give them mental performance consulting as well so that they can understand how to navigate the anxieties, the stress, uh, working with them on attentional focus because, and why this is important from a neurological perspective the mirror neurons. So what coaches are demonstrating to athletes, the athletes are going to mimic that behavior. So the coach could be preaching one thing, be calm, cool, collected, have it together, focus. But if the coach on the sideline covertly and overtly isn't doing it themselves, that that athlete has a very hard chance of enable enacting those behaviors. So I think one of the things that we can do to help fix this issue is to start providing coaches resources and specifically mental health for them to start unpacking the relational trauma that they experienced when they were an athlete. And when I talk about mental health, I'm talking about a clinical setting as well, which is outside my level of expertise beyond just my personal experience in mental health myself. So that they can unpack the relational trauma they experienced as an athlete and maybe also the relational trauma they experienced in other relationships in their life, such as a, mother relationship, a father relationship, a sibling relationship, a professor, teacher relationships, uh, any, any other relationship, because that relational trauma that you've experienced is going to seep into and either enhance or more likely hinder the relationship you have with athletes. And so we have, to my knowledge, there is nothing out there that advocates for coaches that provides them the space and time to go and see a mental health professional to work through those things. If we provide that, I believe we're going to have healthier coach-athlete relationships, healthier athletes, healthier coaches, and we'll see a higher level of sport performance. No, and I, I definitely agree. I, I'm curious as to whether coaches would definitely access it and where those barriers might be in terms of getting... I mean, I'm just thinking of my own experiences of, you know, especially as you said earlier, that as a male and a male coach, you are not supposed to, in inverted commas, you know, show those emotions. And, um, you know, when I have, because I don't hide mine, it's been appreciated by parents and players, but I've definitely felt the shunning as you put it of 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 other coaches and even coach developers before so there's there's this confusion i think with coach practice that i see of 
especially from that sideline on match day where we, you know, it's very easy for us to get emotionally hijacked and it's still something that I'm trying to deal with now. The one that always makes me laugh is when coaches shout from the side, relax, because it's this wonderful paradox, you know, between what they're actually trying to get the players to do. And so that paradox between what they want to achieve and then what they're actually saying. And, and so much of that comes from just their own experiences as, as an athlete, of course. So if, if there's a grand, great deal of this transference going on, and I take your point about advocating for coach mental health and, and offering greater access for it, Again, how do we break that that cycle of the coach not being aware of that transference? We can't be aware of it all the time. Of course, we'd go mad. But becoming a bit more self-aware, it seems to be a, a recurring theme for people that I speak to on this podcast. Do you, do you have some thoughts on, on how that's developed? Yeah, and I want to uh, – so from a sociological perspective, there's something called cultural lag that just because a policy is set in place, which a lot of times, let's say there's a policy uh, that a lot of people are celebrating that's put in place and confetti's in the air and everybody's excited about, of which I get excited about too. I also know from a sociological perspective that it's gonna take anywhere from 10 to 20 years from the entire culture to adopt that new policy. So in this instance, let's say that there was a policy created uh, around coach mental health uh, about providing resources to them, understanding that um, it's going to take people a while to warm up to that idea, especially men that are preach this narrative, this unfortunate narrative um, that, um, and I want to bring up this one quote that I thought I'd put in my uh, chapter from Terrence Real. He wrote, um, a book on uh, the traumatization of boys, especially. And he said, the way that we turn boys into men is through injury, that we sever them from their mothers far too early. We pull them away from their own expressiveness, from their feelings, from sensitivity from others far too early. And that the very phrase, be a man, means to suck it up and keep going. And we think disconnection uh, is not the fallout from traditional masculinity, but in reality, disconnection is masculinity. That boys have been indoctrinated and women as well. Again, I want to bring, I, I don't want to necessarily call out, I want to call people in that we as women have also perpetuated this narrative, right? Like we want men to be more emotional with us, but then when we are, we're like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this, right? Because we haven't learned how to deal with men, men's emotionality. And that really, this is a crisis for men as well. In that how it, you, you were born this beautiful emotional being that loves others and wants to call people in, but time and time again on the playground, in practice, as you grew up, you were taught that that was, don't do that. You were, you were called names. You were, and so you were socialized into that if I want to be in the in-group, right? We have this sense of belonging we're hardwired for connection neurologically. We want to belong with people. So we learn very, very young that in order to belong in the in-group, have friends, we can't, men can't be emotional. Um, and so you learn that so young. And so I understand by wanting to advocate for coaches with mental health that this isn't going to be a, yeah, let's give you mental health. And then all the coaches are going to flock to these resources because I see you. I hurt for you. I cry about this for you, that you weren't held when you needed to be held and you weren't told you were loved. You were told to suck it up. You weren't told, yeah, let's lean into this. Let's cry it out, right? You were told to not cry about it. You were told to stifle it down. And that breaks my heart because how cathartic those things have been for me as a woman, you haven't had the privilege to do that. So I do understand that. I do think, and I want to share this story. I was speaking with a male coach about this and how I want to advocate for mental health. And they, I saw tears start welling up. They started streaming and he, it was almost as if he didn't realize that's what he needed. And he just, he was like, I can't, 
it, even if he didn't access those resources to know that it was there to know that higher powers were saying hey we care about you enough that we're going to give you this resource like the subtext that that's writing is cathartic in and of itself um, and so this is not me speaking about how I want to mandate this and how coaches have to engage in it but just like we're caring for athletes enough to provide them that resource and send the subtext of, hey, we care about you enough to give you this if you want it. Why are we not doing that the same for coaches? Because as coaches experience that care from sport administrators, higher ups in sport that create these policies, they will then be able to provide that same care to athletes. So we can't give other people what we give other people what we've never experienced. And if we keep not giving coaches these things, they're not going to be able to give athletes those things either. Mm. I'm just taking all of that on board. And uh, again, you know, thank you for, for being so clear about it. It, it feels like it's, it's going to be that slow movement, that cultural lag, as you described it, because we are dealing with something that has been so embedded for such a long time. Um, I know we're, we're speaking about coaches here, but it, when I've been working with, uh, developing coaches and trying to get them to see a little bit more around the, the social and emotional competency development of the athletes, which obviously means that they have to be, that there's this disconnect in particular around that perception of developing resilience, being disconnected from being emotionally competent, that, you, that for some reason we've got this idea that the two can't be connected when they absolutely can. And I would go as far as arguing that they need to be. Um, so to, to go further of this, this process of calling in, um, I understand that you, you teach uh, around diversity and equality at the university. I'd be one of the first to put my hands up and say that I don't know enough uh, about this, this area in sport. Um, to me, it feels like in the UK that we, we have made movements and strides towards improvements in this area, but perhaps we're a, a bit of a distance off as of yet. You know, it's, it's a very difficult space to engage in from, from my perspective. I've definitely heard or felt the sort of phrase of, well, you're a white male, so you, how could you possibly know? which of course shuts down the conversation straight away. So how, do, how would you su suggest for someone like myself to navigate that particular problem and start to understand a little bit more about my place in this? Mm. Gosh, such a great question that I have to applaud you for asking because I understand that that's really hard to ask as a white man right? Like you're basically outing yourself right now, which I think, uh, I think is beautiful. I mean, this is vulnerability um, in a nutshell. So thank you for that. I want to address this question by talking about how I've navigated it. So um, I am fairly privileged. I'm mostly privileged. The only knock I have against me in a marginalized perspective is that I'm a female. And so I've had to learn this the hard way, similar to you especially when I worked with an extremely diverse population of Latin players, um, male Latin players, and they would, uh, their understanding of women is very traditional as well. So they look at women as the nurturers, the homemakers, the cookers, all of those things. And so that was definitely at play in them coming and speaking to me and opening up more to me than they potentially would a uh, male mental performance consultant. And so I was working with these athletes as a mental performance consultant and they came in, one of them came into the office. Well, one of them showed up to practice extremely lethargic, not, they were usually a high, had a lot of energy, brought a lot of heart to the team in this particular day. They didn't. And so I noticed it. I was like, what's going on? Like, did you not get any sleep last night? Were you playing Fortnite all night? You know, kind of joking around. And he was like, nah, like that's not it. And I could just tell something was going on. And I said, well, if you want to speak about it, I'll be in my office after practice today. He came by. He sat down uh, and he began to speak to me about how one of his uh, old, I think it was a family member, a cousin, uh, had actually been stabbed multiple times uh, back home. And... Here I am, like, how do I deal with this? We didn't talk about this in class. There was no, like, I've, I've taken a counseling skills class. I've taken a multicultural class, but I'm just like sitting there like, 
what the heck? Um, but I'm just, you know, I'm like, wow, oh my gosh. And he's talking about, you know, like this is the reality of coming from this particular country that he was coming from, uh, that their narrative growing up is kill or be killed. And that one of the only ways out of that narrative is to go into this particular sport. And so I, in that moment, and this is what I would suggest for you to do. I, I looked at him and I said, I'm a white woman that was born and raised in a safe environment in the South of the United States of America. There's no way I could understand what you're going through. Yet I want you to know that I'm in this room with you right now, ready to hear. And I want you at, as comfortable as you are to help me understand this and that you don't have to do this alone. But I by no means am ever going to fully understand this. But that doesn't mean you have to do it alone. The entire conversation shifted. I mean, it was as if I had, I had just, because I was in power and because I acknowledged that cultural difference, boom, wall down, there I had access. And when I say access, it was, it provided me access to know how to best support him. And what I saw happen after that, I think really speaks to what I decided to do in that moment. And, and I have to mention before that I had messed up royally in those, I had learned it to hard, I'd gotten to that space by learning it the hard way. And days following, all of a sudden I had all of these Latin players walking into my office. Hey, so-and-so talked to, I was talking to so-and-so last night and they told me I should talk to you. And so that one player, because I had said, I'm a white female, there's no way. All my demographics point to safety, point to privilege, but I'm still here with you to sit with you. I want to understand, and you don't have to do this alone. They then started saying, you need to go talk to Sarah. You need to go talk to Sarah. She understands because she's not, she's not trying to say she understands. Thus, she understands, if that makes sense. And so that's what I would say to anybody listening to this podcast. I would say to you is just acknowledging that if you have a, uh, somebody in front of you, let's even say it's another white male to a white male. Not everybody's white male experience is the same. And so to say that, to say, wow, like, I understand I'm a white male and, and you seem to present as such too, but there's no way I can understand what you're going through. I would love to sit with you and, and for you to help me understand. How powerful is that? Uh, because we all have unique stories, unique experiences. And for you as the person in power to acknowledge that, really helps that athlete see that I'm with you, I see you, I hear you, and I believe you, no matter my positionality. Brilliant again, and, and, and thank you. So, I mean, what, the phrase that came up for me and one that has been suggested previously is this idea of holding space. And, and it's, you know, it's only something really that I've become aware of in the last sort of six months or so. And, you know, typically I would have prided myself on being a good listener, an active listener. Um, it definitely would be something I would have identified as like part of my personality previously and, and certainly as part of being a coach. And then I heard about this concept of holding space and had to really kind of reconsider as to whether it was really what I was doing because I hadn't been guarding against this transference the transference of, well, within what my consideration of what this subculture is, you should be doing, or I would advise, or not necessarily using those words, but, but that's basically what I'm saying. But what you've described with your, the, the Latin player there is, is, is holding space, I think, if I've understood it correctly, which is just, you've heard it, you've taken it on, you will have had an emotional response, but you're, you're not transferring that over to uh, the person that is describing that you know, painful stuff to, to you. Cl clearly, as a, uh, maybe some of the coaches listening, well, I simply don't have the time to, or the resources to, to work with these players in, in this way. You know, I have a su suggestion maybe afterwards that I'll, I'll make as to what I suggest to coaches that they can do, but I'm more interested in yours. Um, 
what what can coaches do if you say they have maybe three contacts a week with a with a set of players and they're holding down a full-time job at the same time you know again your coach is holding a position of power could be huge in the well-being of those athletes how might they go about doing that whilst juggling everything else yeah, um, I, I would, if you don't mind, I'm very uh, interested in what your suggestion is, um, if you wouldn't mind, and then we can kind of have the conversation there. No, of course. Um, so, so my suggestion is, is nicked from uh, a, an ex-lecturer of mine, Kerry Bowley, uh, who used the, the question, what's the score today? And... I've used it ever since because I mean, my, my head was blown at the time and, and it continues to be a really important technique for me on arrival. Usually when players come in, you know, Hey, uh, John, what's, what's the score for you today? And of course, when you ask it the first time, they've got no idea what you're going on about. So you have to explain it a little bit, but after a while they get used to this idea and they're sort of half expecting the question. In fact, sometimes I've had athletes tell me before I even ask, hey, you know, hey, coach, it's 3-0 today. Oh, fantastic. What happened for you? you know, and obviously, they're more than happy to tell you, usually. But there's so much that you can gain indirectly about where that athlete is that day. You know, you can watch for, for, and, and try and have some empathic accuracy about what their answer means. But if they're telling you it's 3-0 mm-hmm. to the other team in this in this example you can have a pretty good idea that they've had a rough day and you might have a good enough relationship with them at that point to be able to ask another question but the reason i use this all the time is very often don't have the time but what i can do is knowing that what i now know that that child at least from their perception has had a bad day of it I might leave them alone in the first five minutes. Just let them get on with the activity, get into their social engagement system, enjoy being around with their friends. So it just gives me a little bit of information to, to act upon. Um, so yeah, that's the suggestion that I always draw back on. That's so wonderful. Um, and I'm glad I asked you to share first because I, I want to bring that into what I'm speaking about because I don't think what we're going to talk about is that much far off. Uh, it's just a different way of doing it. And it made me think about uh, Jean-Francois Menard that's a, um, based out of Canada, mental performance consultant with the Canadian Olympic team, uh, came and spoke to our University of Tennessee uh, cohort when I was there with my PhD. And he uh, told us very, something very similar to ask, uh, start out asking an athlete on a scale of one to 10, what's your number today? 10 being great, zero being not so great you know, they might say, oh, I'm a seven. And then to say, tell me more about that seven, the likelihood, because from a neuroscience perspective, we have something that, uh, a tendency towards something called a negativity bias, which is that largely, I would even argue 99 to 100% of the time, they're going to start telling you every reason why they're not a 10, instead of telling you every reason why they are a seven. And so we, we do that as a mental performance consultant because we can help them reframe, very slight reframe, right? Instead of focusing on what you don't have, let's focus on what you do have. And it's just a place, you know, for coaches, mental performance consultant, very, like what's the score today? You can understand if they tell you a four, I think that's brilliant what you said, you know, for the first five minutes, I'll lay off of them. Or for a coach to think, you know, let me not be a reason why they're four nil today, right? Like in the big scheme of things, you actually contributing to them being four nil when they get done with you is going to hinder their performance overall and giving, giving them that space. Uh, I want to bring in my colleague, Dr. George McConnell. He's a uh, professor of theater. And I think theater is such a great uh, um, scholarly department that can inform coaching. And so I went, I've actually gone and observed multiple of his classes this semester for me to learn more. How can we use theater to better inform coaching? And one of the things he did so brilliantly in his class is at the beginning of every class, he, he has a check-in with every single student very quick and they have to popcorn to another student. Uh, so that can build team cohesion. And it's just, hey, check in, how you feeling today? Uh, today I'm feeling actually great. Got eight hours of sleep last night, doing good. Popcorn, next student. Uh, not feeling so great, the election's going on, I'm stressed out, I have a lot of anxiety, whatever. And 
Dr. McConnell always makes the, the statement at the end of every single check-in. He says, why do we, he asks the class, why do we do this? And, and almost like together, they'll be like, so that we can understand how to empathize with people when they're walking into a space to act. And so that, that way, especially Dr. McConnell himself is the power figure in that room. He can then know how to better interact with students. So this particular day I was in there, there was one student that said, you know, I'm not good. I just got really bad medical news back, not doing great. This particular uh, student had to get on stage and do their uh, monologue and they ended up breaking down and Dr. McConnell was like, hey, it's okay. Let's actually, you know, what would you be comfortable with doing right now? And they said, I would, I would like to just sit down, go to the bathroom and then just end today, of course. And because he knew that prior, he was better able to empathize. And I think if we could have coaches do more of that and just the subtext being written is that I see you, I hear you and I believe you instead of like forcing like I grew up in sport I don't know about you our coaches taught us it doesn't matter what the heck happened to you today when you walk through those doors the only thing that matters is practice right now I'm still not good at doing that because we shouldn't be good at doing that we should never be good at having to cope with like compartmentalizing our pain which is really just shoving it down because that pain and that hurt and that three nil is not welcome in this space because I can't handle it myself as a coach Right. Um, and so I, I love what you brought in because uh, I think that that's so important that coaches do. Um, I do want to, and you've mentioned this, uh, and I want to speak to the sport administrators here and the individuals that have power out over how sport operates um, and even coaches that have power over how their practices operate. All research suggests and uh Dr. Jowett, that's based out of the UK, uh, is the lead researcher on coach-athlete relationships, and all of her research points to, and every other research I've seen, is how powerful the coach-athlete relationship is to performance. And so I'm advocating for a, a complete paradigm shift, because we're living in a world now where we are outcome-based versus process-based. So we are, everything is tethered to win-loss, and then anything else that's not win-loss is just a sidebar. And so Jowett's work, along with my work and everybody else, is the relationship should be the foundation. And if you don't have a good foundational relationship, and I'm talking just a humanistic coach-athlete relationship that's infused with cultural understanding, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, then anything else, the tactical, the technical of sport, is only going to achieve so much. And so it's not just about making the paradigm shift from an outcome-based win-loss to process-based. This is a process associated with technical and tactical aspects of sport, but it's about the relational process first. Then we can get to the process of the technical and tactical, and then we can get to the, the, um, the outcome-oriented things. I think as a society, we have conned ourselves into believing that we've achieved optimal performance. <laughs> I don't even think we have untapped or break, broke the glass ceiling to experience the optimal performance that we can experience because we have lied to ourselves all these years. We think we've achieved it and that's our way of coping with, well, this is good enough. Um, and so my call is to sport administrators, coaches, how can we create space? Maybe it's even creating spot policies to where coaches can hold space for athletes and we're not asking them to go over and beyond that holding space isn't over and beyond what they're already having to do in their 40, 60, 80 hour, 100 hour work weeks. Um, I cannot tell you the amount of coaches that when I tell them this, and some of them are probably thinking it right now as they're listening to this, I would love to do that. And I'm tired. <laughs> or I would love to do that. And I have my own family that I have to take care of. And if we create that space, where we actually privilege the coach athlete relationship within how coach oper or within how sport operates, we can let coaches breathe to be able to hold space for athletes and to hold space for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, so important. Uh, I, you know, I, I want to to bring that back round to your book and and as as a a possibility for exposing. Um, not exposing, creating exposure to uh, some of those potential positives, potential negatives that can come from that coach-athlete relationship. You mentioned Dr. Sophia Jowett and 
I like her more recent stuff that was talking about coach athlete centered relationships rather than just athlete centered. Cause I think we'd miss yes, yes. that point of, you know, then focusing so, so much upon the athlete and forgetting that it is that relationship between the, the, the entirety, whether that's a team or whether it's an individual dyad. So just give us a, a little bit more flavor as to what is contained within this book. And then once you've done that, let us know how it is that we can lay our hands on it. Oh, of course. Um, I have to say I am, I back Jowett's work. I also advocate not the history of that as we started out coach centered, then we went to athlete centered. And I think we need a coach athlete centered. We don't need to forget the coach in all of this. They are just as important and beautiful of humans as athletes are. Um, so my book, uh, the, the flavor of it, and it has taken many different drafts to get to this final product, which I'm very proud of where it's been. It's been a growing process personally and professionally for me, um, is that there's, it's letters written by athletes. Uh, they're confidential letters. Um, I took out all identifying information. So, uh, there's no reference to their sport, the level of play of which there is, youth, college, professional, Olympic represented in this book. Um, no names are used of universities or individuals or of organizations. Uh, and it starts out, I will say a bias of mine because I didn't have the best coach athlete relationships growing up, or they were, I'll put it this way. They were very patriarchal in nature. And so they were perpetuating the relational trauma that we see in so many people today. My bias was that I was only going to get bad letters, right? The not so good letters, the letters written to coaches about what they hated about them and what they wish they could have said, but never did. And what they would have rather the coach have done. Uh, and when I actually opened up, I went for my dissertation and opened it up to receive letters from anyone. I got an onslaught of letters of which there was a, uh, a major, not a majority. There was a, a portion of them that were the thank you letters what they wish they could have told their coach, but never did. And so that's the main question I ask these athletes. What do you wish you could have told your coach, but for whatever reason, never did. And the fact that I received thank you letters amongst the not so good letters was very eye opening to me as a communication person that I have two degrees in communication, because really what we see here in what sport has bred is a barrier in communication, whether good or bad that we've been taught as athletes that like, if you do say thank you, it's just like at the end of the season when you're like, hey, thanks coach for everything you did, you're the best. Or maybe a text message that goes into a little bit more detail, but not to the extent these letters are, that say, this is what you did, this is why it positively influenced me, thank you for that. And so there are 11 letters in the book, so there's 30 letters total, 11 of those are in part one that are the good letters. Part two is the not so good. Uh, they are the letters of what I wish I could have told you, but never did what I hated that you did and wish you would have done. And then part three, um, this was the part of the book that changed drastically uh, from what the first draft, the first draft was me as a scholar being egotistical, telling coaches exactly what they needed to do. And as I was teaching a methods of coaching class uh, fall of 2019. So last fall, I was telling the, athlete, or the, the aspiring coaches about how, you know, as coaches, we need to provide space for athletes to have voice. We need to champion their voice, uh, let them know that they have a level of con like opening the athletes up to teach the coach. And in the middle of, of this lecture, I stopped and I was like, I'm doing the same thing in my book. I'm telling coaches exactly what they should do instead of inviting them in and having a conversation and letting them teach me or empowering their voice in the book. And so I went from part three being, this is what you should do. Here's the correct formula, which is very much tethered to this outcome based. And I actually opened up part two, part three is called the truth. Um, and it has a upper a capitalized T in the book for grammatical purposes, but I make the argument that this is, I'm, I mean it to be a lowercase T because this is my truth, right? It's not the all consuming, all, um, all knowing truth. And I share actually my dear coach, my composite dear coach letter uh, to my coaches. And then I transition into providing coaches space to speak their truth, to write their own letters. Um, I bring sport administrators in. So part three is very much, I want to call people in rather than calling them out, which I started out by calling people out. Uh, 
and then the way it is now, I want to call people in and I want to start a conversation. I provide a couple of uh, suggestions for policy change I think needs to be made. However, I by no means think that they are uh, the end all be all, but rather here, here's some suggestions for policy change so that we can start a conversation. Um, and so that's really the flavor of the book is that I don't think my book is going to completely fix anything in sport. Um, I think that it will start hopefully a ball rolling in a more productive direction, not just for athletes, for coaches, sport administrators, and all other stakeholders in sport. Um, as far as right now, the book, uh, so I have the actual physical copy. You cannot purchase it online. Um, the ebook won't come out until March 2nd, 2021. And then the physical book will not be able to be purchased on Amazon or in brick and mortar stores until June 22nd, 2021. But I do have a uh, advanced reader copies. So I have the physical copy in my own possession um, that I'm selling uh, so through my Instagram account. So at Doc Serdner, so D-O-C underscore S-E-R-D-N-E-R -E -E is my handle. Uh, so on my bio, I have a Google form there that you can request signed author copies. So uh, those are $20 a piece plus shipping and handling. Um, so you can do that uh, on my Instagram. I have it on my Twitter as well with the same handle, Doc Serdner, um, where you can go and order them. I will say this about how you can access my order, uh, my book, given that you're in Scotland right now. So the, one of the sticky points I brought up with you is that I wanted to send you a book, but shipping internationally is almost twice the amount. Uh, that the book would cost. And so if there's anyone who knows uh, how to ship internationally to make it cheaper, that would be great. Um, but for, uh, so that's just something to keep in mind internationally, but for domestic, so within the United States, uh, I'm able to ship fairly cheaply. So usually just for one book, it would cost $24. Uh, to purchase so yeah I'm, I'm not sure my my network extends to uh international shippers as of yet but uh maybe, maybe someone listening knows someone that can help and you know in terms of what the book is you know everything that you've told me about it both today and and previously you know, it can be quite easy as coaches engaged in academic the academic world or otherwise to continually be taking on technical information and then the how to's and what I think this book offers is an opportunity to really engage in something that is a little bit more anecdotal and therefore to consider our own narratives and our own biographies a little bit more which you know thank you so much for taking the time to, to put that book together and to consider it so carefully I do have one last question for you which is if you were to have an audience with just one person, anyone I was able to get hold of for you, who would that be? Oh gosh. Give like considering your network of people. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> let's let's assume I'm I'm capable <laughs> of, of of more than that. No, just of anyone. 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 Gosh, I feel like this is. I have a a, a magic like a genie, and I have wishes. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm going back and forth. I think going back to my original, uh, Bell Hooks has been such a mentor to me. Uh, she's an African American feminist scholar that has really helped me see the world in a more inclusive way. And um, I would love to sit down with her and have conversations about how to infuse the work that she does uh, into what we're doing to make sport a safer place. And I think if I was, uh, could be selfish enough to have somebody else in that room to have, you know, Dr. Sophia Jowett in there, uh, to just this big collaboration. And, and that's the biggest, one of the things I do, I make the point in the book is that we live in a world where we're all in our echo chambers. So coaches teaching coaches, uh, academics, for example, we're in our echo chamber. There's nothing that holds us accountable to disseminating our research to the general population um, in book form, particularly, or doing things like this, such as podcast. And how can we start uh, hold ourselves accountable to merging those echo chambers? So to having scholars influencing uh, coaches and then people like bell hooks that are thought leaders in the world 
so that, that would be a dream of mine to have a conversation with her. And I highly recommend the listeners of your podcast to check out Bell Hook's work. So her name is lowercase, so B-E-L-L uh, space Hooks, H-O-O-K-S. That is her writer name. Her actual name is Gloria Watkins. Um, and she has her name lowercase for a reason, um, as to not think of herself as is important to need a capitalization. And she is a very prolific writer that speaks on things such as the book, The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love. I think it sheds light on the root of a lot of problems we see in sport, with sport being, uh, sport is a microcosm of the bigger society, so. Brilliant, two two things, everyone chooses two, so you're not alone there. Uh, Everyone breaks that rule. Uh, and, and secondly, that is the second time that Bell Hooks has come up. So I think you'll be fighting with a, a previous uh, guest of mine, Greg, Greg Dreyer. But uh, yeah, that's the second time her name has come up. Oh, wow. Well, Greg, I do not want to fight you for her. But if you <laughs> if you get her and I don't like record it and send it to me, we can all work together. Right. Yes. <laughs> but no, let I'm, me send some questions I'm, in. Uh, again, I want to call people in and work with and collaborate with people and start a dialogue. Um, of how can we start working together and setting and working against people, powering with rather than powering over, uh, which is a term coined by Brene Brown's work on vulnerability. So, Fantastic. Sarah, thank you so much. It's been a joy to speak to you today and just leaves me to say welcome to the tribe. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. It's been a blessing to be here. That's it for episode 12 and the first season of the pod. What a journey this has been and I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to put this together and connect with so many speakers and listeners in the process. I hope you found it as useful as I have to hear the speakers' insights and would welcome any feedback and suggestions for future episodes. This year has been tough for everyone to varying degrees. Coaching and education spaces has given us a way to stay connected, hopeful and move forward. For sure, 2021 will bring its own challenges, but as Sarah and so many of my guests have said, there's so much more to come in making our practice truly effective. Stay safe, and we look forward to having you back here in the new year.